And if people come in, please encourage them to fill in. There are some seats here and there um, up front. Um, so welcome. I'm very happy to see everybody here. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I'm Nikki Mandel. I'm a history professor here at, at Whitewater. And it's especially um, exciting for me that our speaker tonight is an historian. Um, he's coming to us through the Organization of American Historians Distinguished um, Speaker Series. And so this is a, like a special treat for all of us who love history. Say yay right now. Yeah? Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, um, I'm not going to actually introduce the speaker. Um, uh, uh, Dean McPhail is going to do that in just a moment. What I want to do is welcome you to this um, talk, which is a part of the campus-wide conversation on race. And I hope all of you know about it. If you don't, you will know about it right now. We started this program uh, at the beginning of the semester, and it will continue on to the end of the academic year, into next May. And the conversation on race at Whitewater is uh, a time for us to build in a series of programs, and some of you have probably been to other conversation on race events, from movies to panels to speakers, digital stories. Um, hopefully you've seen the signage out there between the University Center and Highland with the Moments in History stories. Um, there are also some wonderful online opportunities to take a look at. Um, sometime, I hope, by the end of this week, if not early next week, at the Conversation on Race website, there will be digital stories created by Whitewater students talking about their own experience and thoughts and, and notions of, of race and how it's impacted their lives. And I've seen some of them. They are really incredible. Um, incredible stories and, and the quality of what you, know, you and your peers are able to do is, is really impressive. Uh, I'd encourage you, after you see some of those, if you haven't done one, to think about doing one yourself. Anyway, the conversation on race purpose is kind of twofold and almost moving in opposite directions. One is to recognize that we're at about the 50th anniversary of two really landmark pieces of legislation in civil rights history, the 1964 Civil Rights Act and the 1965 Voting Rights Act. And many people uh, rightly see those as incredible achievements in American history. They were part of a quarter century or more of activist uh, struggles by African Americans, Mexican Americans, Native Americans, Asian Americans, women, gays and lesbians to really try and open up and realize the promise of equality in American life. And things are enormously different than they were 50 years ago. And yet, the conversation on race is also recognizing that in many respects, things are not enormously different that gains once made are not necessarily permanent. And if we look at American society today, we are more segregated by neighborhoods than we were 50 years ago. We are more segregated in our schools than we were 50 years ago. Why, excuse me, Wisconsin holds no proud place in being the state with the highest levels of inequality in some of the worst measures. This is very troubling. And so the conversation on race is not a let's be happy diversity conversation. Uh, the purpose of the conversation on race is to help us think very deeply um, and become more comfortable at having what some people refer to as those difficult conversations. I want to say challenging conversations. And then to think about becoming more skillful at having them by practicing it over and over again, talking to people, like the people next to you, um, our speaker today at the end of, of, of his talk, and realizing that we have to do this. We have to know each other better um, than we know each other. We have to listen to each other, and then move beyond that to think about what can we then do to make the promises that hopefully we all believe in more real for all of us. So please think of this as part of a broader conversation on campus that we all are engaged in by being here. But sitting in your seat is not enough. So I encourage you to do a couple things while you're sitting in your seat right now. First of all, make sure your cell phones are turned off. <laughs> um, there's no recording here except the official recording that we've made arrangements for. And we will potentially post part of this later. Um, but also, please engage yourself in thinking about what you hear tonight. Stay after the official talk and be part of the conversation, the question and answer. And so, oh, last thing, <laughs> if 
please let me not forget this. I want to really thank the support from across campus um, for uh, this talk tonight. It was made possible by really generous support from the College of Letters and Sciences and from a number of departments in particular within the College of Letters and Sciences, the History Department, Race and Ethnic Studies, um, Social Work, and Sociology, Criminal Justice, and Anthropology. And anybody major in those areas or minors say, yeah? Okay, all you LNS people really loud. I'm sorry. Okay, well, let's see what Arts and Com can do. It's also sponsored by the College of Arts and Communications. LNS, please. Yeah. Yahoo! Without any further ado, I would like to introduce um, Dr. Uh, Mark McPhail, the Dean of the College of Arts and Communications, who will introduce our speaker. Thanks. Can you all hear me? No? Okay, somebody's shaking their head no back there and the person next to him shaking his head yes. So. <laughs> During the late 1970s, a number of scholars began to explore the dynamics of white identity as part of the ongoing intellectual conversation about race in America. Benjamin Bowser and Raymond G. Hunt, David Wellman, Janet Helms, and numerous others began to recognize that a transformative understanding of American race history would be unlikely without an acknowledgement and appreciation of the impact of whiteness on that history. A distillation of their different perspectives was perhaps best articulated by Robert Terry, who, who in his book, For Whites Only, drew the following conclusion. To be white in America is to not have to think about it. Few contemporary scholars have helped us to think about being white in America more powerfully and provocatively than our guest this evening, Dr. Matthew Fry Jacobson, the William Robertson Co-Professor of American Studies and History at Yale University. He is the author of several books, including Roots II, White Ethnic Revival in Post-Civil Rights America, Barbarian Virtues, The United States Encounters Foreign Peoples at Home and Abroad, 1876 to 1917, Special Sorrows, the Diasporic Imagination of Irish, Polish, and Jewish Immigrants in the United States, and Whiteness of a Different Color, European Immigrants and the Alchemy of Race. It was through this last work that I had first the pleasure of encountering his writings, and the assessment that I offered then perhaps best describes the importance, power, and prescience of his work for our ongoing conversations on race. I wrote, just as Robert Terry had the intellectual courage to confront and challenge the material white flight he observed happening in our society three decades ago, Matthew Fry Jacobson exhibits a similar willingness to expose and critique the symbolic flight from whiteness that has become all too common in post-civil rights America. This is a book that is impressive in both depth and breadth, that draws from a diversity of sources to address in a thoughtful and honest manner what W.E.B. Du Bois defines as the problem of the 20th century, the problem of the color line. It is my privilege and honor to introduce to the University of Wisconsin Whitewater one of the few voices capable of offering thoughtful and potentially transformative solutions to that problem. Please join me in welcoming Professor Matthew Fry Jacobson to our conversation on race. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation to be here. Um, and thank you especially for coming. It's really amazing to see so many people turn out. And um, I'm going to work really hard to make it worth your while tonight. Um, forgive me for the first part. There's a, there was a kind of a technical situation, so I actually have to advance two different slideshows so that you and I are on the same page. Um, eventually, I will get used to that, um, but it might take me a minute. So um, let me know if. Uh, if I seem to be out of sync with my own slideshow. Okay, um, let me start by offering you a kind of general proposition about thinking about history. Um, 
I think we're often encouraged to think of the past as something that we've left behind us and something that is distant and therefore something that we're separate from. History unrolls in, in a straight line. It's linear. Um, things that happened 50 years ago um, are separate from us. Things that happened 150 years ago are, are even further separate from us. And what I want to propose at the outset here um, is that Another way to look at it is think of, of history not as a line uh, and the past not as something that's left behind, but think of it more in terms of, kind of set, the kind of sedimented layers that you see in a geological formation. So there are layers that are deeper and, and less visible than others, but you're still standing on them. Um, and just to take an instance, let me, let me talk about one particular case. This is a photograph I took at an immigrants' rights rally in 2010. Uh, the rally was in New York. It was in response to the first wave of passages of state laws beginning with SB 1070 in Arizona and then copied in Georgia and Alabama and other states. Um, the law that became known over time as the Papers, Please law. It was called that because the law says uh, it obliges local police officials to surveil and discover the citizenship status of anyone they encounter, and to do that with cause. So the question became quickly, what, what is going to, what's cause going to consist of? Now, proponents of the law said, the federal government has lost, has lost control of the borders, has lost control of the immigration process, we're losing our country, we have to control our borders in a different way, and SB 1070 and laws like it are going to do that. Uh, op opponents of the law said the, the things that are going to be used as cause, ultimately, because humans are humans, it's going to be skin tone and accent. Those are the people who are, going to, who are going to be surveilled in this particular way. And the police are going to be surveilling them in ways that they're not surveilling other segments of the population. So the critique was SB 1070 and laws like it actually set up a kind of, 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 of bias against uh, a certain segment of the population on the part of police. They criminalizes a certain part of the population. So, so the photograph that you're looking at at this rally, do I look illegal, is a very immediate kind of response to a very current social question in 2010. But it's also within a context of a kind of post-1986 world of immigration discourse. In 1986, the Reagan administration passes the Immigration uh, Reform and Control Act. It's an act that's probably best remembered for uh, granting amnesty to undocumented immigrants who had been in the country for long enough and could document their presence. They couldn't document their legality, but they could document their presence and, and they were allowed to stay. The other side of that bargain, though, was after those people were allowed to stay, a new, much harsher regime of border control would be put in place. And that's one of the things that, in fact, uh, does characterize the post-1986 world. Jimmy Carter had actually started militarizing the U.S.-Mexican border a little bit earlier than that, but 1986 is a real marker in terms of the federal expenditure and the kind of military, uh, the, the military equipment and the military tactics that are currently used to, to police that border. The post-1986 world is also a world that's been characterized by a, a particularly harsh kind of discourse around immigration. You hear people in 1986 and after talking about losing control of our borders and losing our country in a way that you really hadn't heard uh, for about a generation. You heard it earlier in the, in the 20th century, but you hadn't heard it in a while. Okay, so this picture is standing on those two sedimented layers, the 2010 layer, the 1986 layer. All of this is also in the context of a very particular post-1965 layer. In 1965, uh, the United States liberalizes what had been a very restrictive immigration policy. So 19, the post-1965 era is an era of heightened rates of immigration. That's one piece of it. The other piece of it is, surprise, surprise, the people who, who penned the law 
were kind of imagining that when they opened the gates, their European aunts and uncles and cousins were going to come pouring over, and that's not who came. The people who came were people from the so-called Third World, people from the Americas, people from Asia, South Asia, India, East Asia, Korea, and later, people from Africa, and a lot of people from the Caribbean as well. So the post-65 layer of this is this, this band of historical time in which the icon and the understanding of who the immigrant is is changing, and for many, it, it represents a kind of crisis. The immigrant is no longer going to be who we've always thought of as the rightful immigrant, and there are millions of them. This is all also post-1924, because do I look illegal? There was not even a kind of legal niche or category for an undocumented immigrant or an illegal immigrant in the way that we think of it now. That didn't exist. That was created by law in 1924. There were ways of restricting immigration. There were laws uh, that, that tried to weed out people who were likely to become a public charge, people who were accused of crimes, people who had certain medical disabilities. Um, but there weren't categorical exclusions, except in the case of the Chinese, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. But immigration law up to 1924 was not a, a quota system, and it was not based on, on categories. The structure that was put in place in 1924 was purposely engineered, and I'm going to say more about this later too, to shut down immigration from places of the world that were thought to be undesirable. But it also, in doing that, it created a system in which there were legal and illegal entrants. So all of this is resting on these different sedimented layers. But finally, you know, to be legal or to be illegal is one thing. To look legal or to look illegal is another. Attaching race to the idea of citizenship, that's something that dates all the way back to 1790. I know that 1790 probably seems like a long time ago to some of you. Um, I was born in 1958, so it seems like just yesterday. But 1790 is not long enough ago that we aren't still standing on that soil. The first naturalization law in this nation's history was penned by the very first Congress. They sat down in 1790 to ask the question, who should we let come to this country and apply for and get naturalized citizenship? Who are the new arrivals who we will accept? And the key clause in that law is free white persons. All free white persons who have or shall migrate into the United States and shall give satisfactory proof before a magistrate by oath that they intend to reside therein and shall take an oath of allegiance, and shall have resided in the United States for one whole year, shall be entitled to the rights of citizenship. This is the very first naturalization law, and I'm going to make the case tonight that it's the most portentous law in American history. Portentous in both meanings of that word. Portentous in what it portended for the history that unrolled after it. And portentous in what it tells us about American political culture and the relationship between race and democracy historically in this, in this country. Um, first of all, how many of you knew that this was the case? How many of you had heard that our first naturalization law excluded everyone who was not white? A few of you, that's great, but definitely a minority, right? We do not tend to learn this in school. Now, one of the things that's fascinating about this is that they debated this law for a long time. We don't have the transcripts, but we have, the dis we have a, a description of those discussions. So these are the framers. It's the very first Congress. And they have a million questions to ask about immigration and naturalization. Should nobles from other lands be allowed to come? Should property holders who continue to hold property in Europe be allowed to be naturalized citizens? Jews, Catholics, what about them? Poor people. Should people have to have someone come and bear witness to their good character? 
They turned this question upside down and backwards a thousand different ways and argued about it and fought about it. Never once did they question that the, the general pool that they were talking about was free white persons. Okay, there are a couple of reasons for this. So that, that presumption that citizenship in the new nation was going to include only free white persons, that presumption, presumption slipped from common sense onto the page and became law without being discussed. Why is this? There are a couple of different ways to think about uh, what was in place to allow them to, to, to be thinking in this particular way. First, there were many, many, many colonial precedents in statutory law where the, the word white or the idea white was in use. Uh, for example, who could own guns, who could participate in militias. That's just one of thousands of examples. So the word white was in, in common usage in legal, in legal ways and in statutory ways already. So that was, that was already part of the legal background that they have. At the moment, though, that they're thinking through this question, there are two dimensions of this that are particularly important. One is the very practical question that's on their minds. This is not a, a simple democracy that they're creating in 1790. It's a settler democracy. And at the moment, two of the biggest threats that they see are Indian wars on the one hand and slave revolts on the other. Those are the two biggest threats that this experimental democracy faces. So from the very outset, an idea like domestic tranquility, that's a phrase I know that you all know because it made it into the founding documents, domestic tranquility is a racialized idea from the outset. It's already shot through with all kinds of notions about race and menace and danger. So that's the practical side. Now this is, you know, you can say, we can talk about this in, in uh, the discussion afterwards. You don't have to think very long to think of ways that, that this might also be one of the, the strata that we're still standing on, right? Think of what happened in Fergus in the summer, for example. You know, there's a lot we can say about that, and I'm not going to go into it, but once domestic tranquility is a racialized idea, then any kind of racially neutral encounters within criminal justice are at least compromised, if not impossible. You know, that's part of, I think, what we see going on in Ferguson. There's an African-American professor at uh, University of Connecticut, Jelani Cobb, was talking about Ferguson, and he said, I'm just going to paraphrase, but it was very powerful. He said, so he's African-American, he says, I've never been in trouble. I've never done drugs. I've never run with people who were in trouble or did drugs. I was a straight arrow. I worked really hard. I was a great student. I went to college. I did well. I went to graduate school and did well. And now I'm a professor. And yet, I have looked down the barrel of a policeman's gun many times in my life. Okay, that is powerful, and that doesn't just speak to the, the immediacy of the minute that we're living in. That goes all the way back to core presumptions about who belongs and who does not, who represents menace and who does not, how do certain people have to be policed and certain others can be ignored. Okay, so that's one dimension of it. The, the practical questions of the founding generation, who can come and who can not, those, those questions unfold amid practical concerns over Indian wars and slave revolts. There's another dimension to this that is more philosophical, you might say. That it's not just the, the practicalities of governing, but it's who can participate in an experiment as radical as democracy. Now, limiting the polity to free white persons and to limiting voters to free white property holding males, from our point of view in the 21st century, that seems incredibly narrow and limited and not radical at all. But at its moment, there still was something quite radical about the move from monarchy to democracy. You know, in monarchy, 
All of the power descends from the crown. All social authority descends from the crown, and it runs hierarchically from top to bottom. And social order is, is fairly rigid, and the way that power is deployed is fairly predictable. Now, the revolution takes that and turns it on its side. And so social authority now is supposed to run horizontally among a freely self-governing people. That's, that's a radical move in its way, or at least in one dimension. So for this generation who's writing the first naturalization law, one of the questions is, who is fit to participate in this bold and daring and dangerous experiment in self-governance? And all of the things that go into dreaming up the good citizen in the new Republican democracy all of those virtues, we need people who are wise, we need people who are far-seeing, we need people who are able to set aside their own, their own interests in order in, in, in able to see the, the, the broader public good. Uh, we need people who are rational. All of these things were in the European and Euro-American imagination during the Enlightenment, these were all also already, like domestic tranquility, these were also already racialized ideas. To say that we need a wise republic, to say we need a wise citizenry, is to say, for these folks, we need a white citizenry. So those two things come together really powerfully, the practical dimension and the philosophical dimension. And so it's very easy for this group of white men to determine that the only people who can come and be naturalized citizens in the new republic are free white persons. Now let me talk a little bit about what's at stake in knowing this, knowing the fact of this law, and in, in thinking about it a little bit. First of all, the legacies of this law run down through American history for centuries. One of the most obvious and, and greatest uh, uh, legacies of it is the massive European immigration that it allows in the ensuing centuries. How many of you trace your own family history through some version of, if not Ellis Island, at least some version of the immigrant saga, you know, starting in steerage, steerage, making your way ashore, making your way to the Midwest or whatever. How many of you have a family history? Okay, you are the legacy of 1790. First of all, let's just start there. It's the free white person's clause of the 1790 naturalization law that allows for that to happen. 26 million people come from Europe between the Civil War and World War I alone. I mean, that is, is one of the, the largest kind of movements of human populations in human history. That is, is allowed for by the law. Another question to ask here, how many of you who just raised your hands, who have that, that family history, actually I'm raising my hand too, how many of you came from, let us, I'll just name a couple of countries. Um, your family traces its roots to the Jewish part of Russia, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Greece, and Ireland. Let me just start with those five. Okay. We are also, and I'm raising my hand, we are also the legacy of 1790. In that, if they had seen us coming down the pike, they would not have settled for a word as vague as white. We were not the free white, pers the free white persons they saw crossing the ocean. They really were thinking about their fellow Britons and maybe Germans because there was this odd, there always has been this kind of odd mythology about how the Anglo-Saxons and the Teutons had a lot in common and they were liberty-loving people and so in some ways the Germans were excused. But a lot of people from the uh, other parts of Europe and especially southern and eastern Europe uh, became pariah groups in ways that I'll talk about in a minute, uh, but they were, they were clearly not the people that the framers had in mind. So one of the unintended legacies of the law uh, was to allow for this other part of kind of European immigration. Quickly, two more legacies just to kind of get at how rich uh, and important this history is. Uh, the Chinese Exclusion Act, that's another legacy of the 1790 Naturalization Clause. Chinese immigrants could come, and they did in, in modest numbers between the 1850s 
uh, and the passage of the exclusion law in 1882, but they couldn't become citizens. They could, they could be here, but they could not be citizens. They could not be involved politically, right? Which meant that when there was a movement against them, when they became a pariah group, in, whether it was because they were thought to be racially ex inferior or whether it was thought that they were unfair competition to white laborers, and they're both of those strains are in the anti-Chinese movement. But when that movement crests in the 1870s and early 1880s, there is no politician on the scene who is answerable to a Chinese voter anywhere. You know, the Chinese had been uniquely set up for that moment of exclusion by their exclusion from citizenship at 1790. Fast forward a couple of generations during World War II, the, uh, the internment of the Japanese, right? Why were the Japanese treated so differently from German Americans and Italian Americans? Now sure, there were some German Americans and Italian Americans who were interned, significant numbers actually, but in their cases it was always on the good old fashioned police work of finding people who are you know, involved in espionage, who are involved with particular anti-American groups or, or, or aiding and abetting the enemy. But if you were German and you weren't doing that, if you're German-American and, and you weren't doing that, you were fine. In the case of the Japanese, blanket. If you were Japanese, that was enough. Didn't matter what you were involved in. And again, that's because the Japanese, having been excluded by the law of 1790, were uniquely vulnerable to that kind of pressure and outlook on the part of their white neighbors, uh, and uniquely vulnerable legally to that kind of, of uh, uh, internment. Okay, so, so these are things that matter, and they matter for a very long time. Uh, that 1790 law, the Free White Persons Clause, is on the books all the way until 1952. Okay, that is one of the key ideas that's shaping not just our conceptions of the American citizen, but the legal frameworks that, that govern it. Now, there were a couple of additions. Right uh, in the wake of the Civil War, uh, one addition was persons of African nativity and descent. So that was an addition, but free white persons as a clause, that still stays on. And during World War II, since the Chinese were our allies, they were also included. There was an exception made for them. But again, the free white persons clause stayed in, in place and there was just an addition made to it. So that core conception of not just the ideal American citizen, but in a sense, the American citizen was rooted to racial conceptions of whiteness for the first 162 years of the nation's history. Let me say a couple things about what's at stake in, in really thinking through this history. One is that we're always told that the real genius of the American political system is that it's all about individual liberties in a way that other countries have never been. That's what the country is founded on, individual liberties. Start to think of it in these terms and understand the power of this law and other laws like it you start to see right away that actually the country has been built on group histories. People have been included as, as groups, they've been excluded as groups, they've been interned as groups, they've been enslaved as groups and emancipated as groups, they've been denied the vote as groups and then granted the vote as groups. So there's a sense in which um, our, our standard notions, our standard narratives of individual rights versus group rights are a little bit askew. We, 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 mis, we misnarrate our history and so we kind of misunderstand it. Another way of thinking about this is two of the most common metaphors that we use to talk about American diversity, and you've heard these a thousand times in different ways, right? One is the melting pot and the other is the mosaic, the potato salad, I mean, there are all kinds of different, right? You've heard them though, right? So with melting pot, everyone jumps into the pot and they melt down and they become each other in a sense. They, they, disappear, they disappear, there's a kind of uniformity. The other, everyone maintains their individual integrity, right? In the mosaic, the blue tiles don't become red tiles, but they look mighty nice next to the red tiles, right? In the potato salad, the tomato doesn't become celery, 
but add them together and it kind of works. Or there's, you know, there's the symphony metaphor. There are all these metaphors. But in all of them, they conceal much more than they reveal. Because none of them talk about power relations. Every, each of these models has everyone jumping in to the polity on totally equal footing. You know, so we think of diversity as having to do with difference either in you know, language, customs, traditions, religion, and it's something that's very easy to celebrate when you're thinking of it in those terms. It's a smorgasbord, right? But what we also need to think about when we're thinking about diversity is the very different legal niches that different groups have occupied over time. If you are living in a country that enslaved your ancestors and then liberated them, you are living in a very different country than a country that provided a haven for your ancestors who were fleeing pogroms in Russia, right? Your relationship to that country and to its state is totally different. If you came as a Chinese immigrant who was denied any, any uh, avenues towards citizenship, you are, even though you're an immigrant, you're living in a very different country than the Irish immigrant who not only was granted citizenship very quickly, um, but in a city like Boston was actually kind of running things pretty quickly, right? Through gathering together and, and, and using their vote to assert a kind of Irish power on the local scene, right? So when we think about diversity, we're not just thinking about language and custom and culture, we're thinking about the very different, or people who, who, who entered the polity through conquest, right? Or in dispossession, people who lost their lands, people who, as, as uh, the great uh, performance artist um, or, uh, Gomez Pena says, uh, Guillermo Gomez Pena says, I didn't cross the border, the border crossed me, right? Those people in, in what is now the Southwest of the United States, or people in Hawaii, or people in Puerto Rico, are living in a very different, they're inhabiting a very different political space than either people who were enslaved and then liberated or people who were voluntary migrants. So that's a dimension of, of so-called multiculturalism that we really need to think about and, and pay more attention to. So one of the, the things that this points up is that what we think of as identity politics, which most of us tend to think of as kind of a post-civil rights era thing, right? There was this realm of individual liberties and suddenly there was a civil rights movement and suddenly people started thinking about their group status and their group standing and they started kind of behaving as groups, right? 1790 naturalization law is identity politics par excellence. You know, this is a, this is a story that goes way back to the beginning. And not only does identity politics go way back, but this arrangement of inclusions and exclusions structures what those discussions are going to look like in a very particular way. So you have the we the people, you know, the white voters, the white property holders, the white males who are voters, uh, the, the people who wrote the law that says only free white persons can come and participate. And then you have all these others who are excluded. And in that instance, the people who are on the outside who want to fight to get on the inside have two basic choices. One is, we're going to make the argument that we're just like you. This is a slander. You are mistaken. Give us a chance and you will see that there's no difference between you and me. Let us into the circle of we the people and we will show you that, that we, we can be and will be just like you. That's, you might call it the argument from sameness or the kind of assimilationist argument. The other argument, the pluralist argument, the argument from difference. Yes, you're right that we're different from you. Where you're wrong is in your hierarchical understanding. You are not superior to us. We are not inferior to you, but we're just different. And if you let us into the circle of we the people, we will show you that our difference can be actually a gift and a benefit to the republic. Let us in and you'll see that even though we're different, we're gonna add something that, that you can use, right? Now these two arguments, some of you might recognize the Booker T. Washington, W.E.B. Du Bois debate kind of framed in that argument. It's the argument that frames American feminism, whether you're talking about the 1920s or the 1970s. You know, give us the vote because 
women and men aren't different. Give us the vote because women are completely different from men and will bring a certain higher level of morality to the polity, right? Sameness, difference, same kind of argument. This is the argument that frames the political life of every immigrant group I know anything about. And that's because it's that structure of inclusion and exclusion kind of sets it up that way. There are, very, there are fewer choices to make in talking about your own identity, your difference, your status, your, your, um, your quality as, as a people. Okay. The last thing I want to say about why this is so important, and this is, if you walk away with anything from tonight, this is the thing. So write this down. You can disagree with it, but turn it over in your head a couple of times. Because what all of this is suggesting is, you know, we're taught from grade school onward, to, we're taught to think that in American political life, there's this big grand project called democracy, and it's one of the best things that human history has ever developed, and it's great, and it's big, and it's important, and it's democracy, and it's like this. And then there's this ugly little blot called racism, and it's really ugly, and it's really bad, but it's kind of small, and it's way over here, like this. So you got democracy, and you got racism. 1790 is telling us the opposite. 1790 is telling us that in this setting, it's not necessarily so. This isn't inherent to democracy, but it is the case for democracy in North America. Democracy and racism have been mutually constitutive. They've shaped each other. What 1790 tells us is racism was the guarantor of democracy. Democracy was going to work because the framers were going to exclude the peoples who they saw as dangerous, right? And I think that that's one of the reasons why, democ or why, why racism has been so difficult to root out. If it wasn't so, so much a core principle of, of not just the, the notions of, but the history of democracy, it would be a much simpler matter, right? Then it might just be a matter of, of individual bigotry that can be educated away, right? But it's fundamentally structural to the legal system and to many other systems. It's, it's a core principle. And even though more and more groups have fought their way from the outside to the inside, and what we the people means in 2014 is completely different. It would be unrecognizable to the folks who wrote this law in 1790. Even so, that presumption, that core racialized presumption that the normative citizen is white that, that presumption might have morphed over time, but it has not disappeared. And we, we can look for evidence of it all around us. Okay. So racism and democracy turn out to be, it's like one of those things that uh, it's kind of a puzzle where if you look at it one way, it looks like a bird bath or a vase. And if you look at it another way, it looks like two people in profile. Think of racism and democracy being kind of like that in American political culture. Okay, so, what, are, so wh what do some of the groups do who are left out by this? And what, and what does this mean for some of the groups who were actually allowed in? You know, those of you who raised your hand and claimed Ireland or Greece or, you know, the, Russian pale, or the Jewish pale of Russia. So let's look at that for a minute. One thing that they do, the people who are left out start petitioning for citizenship. They say, you're excluding me because you say I'm an, an uh, alien ineligible to citizenship because I'm not white. Um, you are mistaken in that. And now the way the legal system is set up, they can't say you're mistaken to insist on whiteness because that you just can't challenge that in a court of law. But what you can do is say, you're mistaken. You're saying that I'm not white, but I really am. That's, that's the legal point that you actually do have the power to challenge. And what you get, you get a string of cases starting in the 1870s and going all the way through the 1920s of people from all over the world, Turkey and Syria and Hawaii and Japan and China, coming forward to the US government, having been excluded from citizenship and, and challenging that. I want to draw your attention to two particular cases because they, they kind of illustrate the intentionality of white supremacism in, in citizenship law and also the way that, that law works as a kind of slippery 
Uh, it's, it's, it, we like to think of it as objective, um, but it's serving somebody's interests at every moment. In these two cases, where are they? Takeo Ozawa in 1922. Takeo Ozawa is a Japanese immigrant, but he comes, he comes to the United States at a very young age. He's basically grown up here. He has no connection to Japan. He doesn't know anything about Japan. He was, he was schooled in an American school. He speaks English. He comes to the court. He explains all of those things, and he also points to the color of his skin. And he says, look at my skin. It is, it's nothing but white. I'm whiter than some of the white people in this courtroom. Therefore, you are mistaken to exclude me under the free white person's clause. And the court rules, well, you might be white, but you're not Caucasian. The next year, Bhagat Singh Thind, a high caste Hindu from India, comes to court and he brings an anthropologist with him and he says, I'm white, and not only am I white, but this anthropologist and the discipline of anthropology will tell you that high caste Hindus are actually Caucasians, scientifically speaking. And the court ruled, well, you might be Caucasian, but you're not white. Okay, the law was not only exclusive from the outset, but it was redeployed again and again, intentionally to protect that core idea that only white, and people deemed white by the court uh, could, could be allowed citizenship. So, so those are petitions. Um, some of them amazingly succeed, most of them fail. And where they do succeed, they succeed in really kind of fluky, odd kind of reasonings about what whiteness is. Uh, and, and the very slipperiness of, of whiteness becomes uh, a benefit to some and a continuing trial to others. Then there's the case of those other groups who were white enough to come into the country as free white persons, but who, like my grandparents, were not the white persons that the framers were thinking of. What happens to them? Now, it is true, and this is really, really important, they do come in as free white persons, and because of that, they are granted all of the rights and privileges of citizenship. So they are legally white, and with all of that goes along with that. But, as far as some were concerned, they posed a real problem to the polity. They weren't the white people. They weren't that wise, far-seeing, rational, perfect citizen that the 1790 law was, was meant to describe and to delineate. And what's interesting is all of these groups, so it's the Irish in the 1840s when they, they come in the wake of the famine in huge numbers, unforeseen numbers. And then later in the century when Jews and Italians and Czechs and all these other groups come in huge numbers, the minute they start to be seen as a potential problem socially, they start to be talked about in racial terms. So the figure, the figure on the right here, and this is, this is a cartoon from 18, the 1870s, and anybody at the time would have known exactly what they were looking at. They're looking at the, uh, they're looking at the freed slave here, and they're looking at the, rec the recent Irish immigrant here. And those, the kind of brutish racialized terms within which, uh, or by which, the Irish were depicted has everything to do with the way race was the kind of standard language of talking about social problems. Here's a cartoon from the 1890s showing Uncle Sam and the peoples of the world, and all depicted in kind of hideous caricature, and not just islanders, or not just Chinese people, um, but also people who we would consider uh, to be white, and who, by the free white person's clause, were seen to be white. Here's an anti-immigration cartoon from 1896. The caption is, The Last Yankee, and here's, so you have, the, the good old stock Anglo-Saxon Yankee overwhelmed by the peoples of the world, in, 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 again, in kind of racialized um, depiction. Each one, uh, each one very different from the others, but each one uh, possessing a kind of, of racial or racialized identity. So the, the groups that we think of as white or as Caucasian at this moment in American history are thought of as being Celtic, Hebrew, Mediterranean, Bohemian, there are all these racial categories, as many as 37 in some of the scientific tracts that are written between the 1890s and the 1920s. 
And of course, looking Irish or looking Jewish or looking Italian, it's not just a matter of physicality, but physicality is taken to be a marker of character. The, the, external, the external racialized look reflects the kind of brutishness. This is from Frank Leslie's magazine, and it's supposed to depict a scene where an Italian boy is being brutalized by his family because he, he has disappointed them with the amount of money that he brought home from his day of playing the organ, uh, the, as an organ grinder. All right, but look at, I mean, just the fury and the kind of brutishness in the faces, okay? That's, that's what race means, and it's, it's in this period, and it's, it's how race is deployed. So groups that we think of as ethnicities, that's a very recent invention. That's a, a post-World War II invention, ethnicity. At this moment, they're races every bit as much as African Americans are races. Even though, remember, they're still white persons and they hold all kinds of rights that African Americans do not. But it's important. Here's a cartoon that seems to present a kind of environmentalist argument about the races, right? Here's Uncle Sam tending his garden, and there are all these things that are gonna change the crop, right? So some of them are good, public schools, free press, some of them are bad, like fool fads. But in any case, there's, there seems to be, he's tending a garden and there seems to be some promise that there might be growth. But meanwhile, there's this strong hereditarian argument embedded here because each, each group is different across, you know, from row to row. They're as different as can be and as identical as can be back. So, so there's a kind of counter argument here saying that an Irishman is an Irishman is an Irishman, right? This captures the immigration debates of the 1890s, early 20th century, and it especially captures the racialization of those debates, the ways in which race was the way to talk about the problematic character of different groups. An actor like Rudolph Valentino could actually build a career kind of uh, capitalizing on the in-betweenness of, of Italians. Now this is a year, by the way, around the time that Valentino was at his height, at the end of the silent era, um, there was a case uh, called Rollins v. Alabama, I think it was 1922. A man named Rollins was arrested for the crime of miscegenation, that is he slept with a black woman, right? He's brought to court, but he's found innocent because the white woman who he so is allegedly slept with was Italian. And so the court ruled, as she was Italian, she was not conclusively white, and therefore Mr. Rollins is innocent. So these are not just kind of passing fancies, and these are not just crackpot ideas that people have about who's who, right? These are powerful, they're written into law, they're written into various kinds of legal decisions, and someone like, whoops, I'm sorry, someone like Valentino kind of capitalizes on both his darkness and his whiteness. In The Sheik, the whole plot, he's supposed to be this, this evil Arab, and here in kind of menacing, obviously, but it turns out at the end he's a Spanish aristocrat and he's white and everything is fine. Right, that's the way the plot works, um, but, but he's really capitalizing on the slippage in the racial discourses, and he plays a million roles like this. Now, this does change, though, that 1924 law that I told you about at the outset. In 1924, it's one of the most restrictive laws in American immigration history, and it's written in these racial terms. It's called the National Origins Act, but it really, really is a racial origins act. And if you read the act itself, and if you read the, con the congressional debates, debates around it, it's clear that race is what they're thinking about. And they engineer the law so that it completely shuts down immigration from all of those racially, and these are in quotes, obviously, racially, problematic parts of the world. It shuts down immigration from Asia completely. It shuts down immigration from the problematic parts of Europe almost completely. Almost, not completely, but you know, a, a place like Greece, where you might have been getting tens of thousands of, of immigrants, after 24, you're allowed 100. That's the quote, 100 Greeks can come to the United States. And it was argued on racial terms. Now, one of the things that happens in the wake of that is that well, two things that are important. And here what you see is a cartoon in, in very much in contrast to what we were seeing in those, those 1870s and 1890s cartoons. Here's the immigrants from Europe being gathered in as my children. This is in the 1940s by the Statue of Liberty. 
But in this case, look at them, they are, they're identical. They, these are cookie cutter figures of Euro, the European ethnic groups, so much so that they have to be labeled, right? In those earlier cartoons, there were no labels really needed because the, the uh, conventions of depiction were so powerful. Um, but here they're labeled so you can tell who they're supposed to be. Now what happened between the first period and the second? One is that, that, that law in 1924 solved the immigration problem. So as it ceases to be seen as the social problem that it once was, that being the case, the racial language and even the racial perceptions around it begin to recede. That's one thing that's happening. A second thing that's happening is that African Americans are moving in huge numbers from the South to the North, and they're locating mostly in the same cities that these uh, European immigrants had settled in for the past two generations. So the racial alchemy of cities like Milwaukee, like Boston, like Chicago, like Philadelphia, like New York, are changing completely. In 1877, by far the largest racial problem in Boston was the problem between Celts and Anglo-Saxons. By 1925, the racial problem in Boston was cast as white and black. So there's a way in which you might see these problematic white peoples of Europe as being the first beneficiaries of the great African-American migration. They got the goods in some ways much quicker than the African migrants did because the presence in huge numbers of the African-American migrants changed the local racial politics and alchemy in such a way um, that suddenly these folks didn't seem so different or so scary or so, or so menacing anymore. But the important thing here is just to think about the social distance that is demarked or demarcated between these two moments and think about uh, the, the, the history of migration, but especially the racialized history of civic discourse that helps us kind of explain the distance between these two cartoons. I'm gonna just say a couple of things uh, to, to kind of add an epilogue to this because I'm really eager to hear your, your comments and your, your questions. One is that the rise of, I'm sure that you've all heard the paradigm, it's, this is a nation of immigrants. You've probably heard it a thousand times. That is a relatively new invention when John Kennedy writes it, his book, The Nation of Immigrants, in, in the late 1950s. Um, it's a kind of celebration of the European immigrant past um, that you didn't hear much in the 50s and in the 40s and in the 30s. Um, so in a sense, uh, it marks this moment of arrival of those, net, what we now think of as the white eth ethnic groups. I mean, they, there's a kind of social comfort, enough social comfort now for them to reclaim their immigrant past and to talk about it frankly and even to celebrate it. For Kennedy, one of the things it meant was liberalizing immigration policy, which he tried to do. And, and after his death, uh, Lyndon Johnson did do in that 1960 Act, which we talked about at the very outset, the act that was meant to reunify the families of Europe, but ended up opening the gates to the Third World and the Americas uh, and, and Africa. Um, but one of the things that's interesting, and again, what I'm going to be um, really emphasizing in this epilogue, and there are just a few pieces to it, is the continuing kind of traces of that logic of 1790. So while it's the case that we can elect an Irish Catholic president, first of all, and he can write a book celebrating the immigrant past. And there's, I, I'm just gonna breeze through this, but there's this kind of cottage industry of celebrating those white ethnics. It's on television. Oh, we are near Milwaukee. I guess we should pause over Arthur Fonzarelli <laughs> and La Laverne DeFazio. But suddenly, everywhere you look, there are people you know, who are supposed to be those you know, fresh off the boat, uh, or at least descendants of the great European immigrants, and you see it everywhere you look. Now, the thing that's amazing about this, and we could go on and on and on, and actually we kind of do, but <laughs> the thing that's amazing about it is that that is taking place at the same time that we're militarizing the border, the same time that we're identifying immigration as one of the biggest problems the country faces. We're losing control of our country. We're gonna spend, you know, billions ultimately on defending the border, but we're going to do that at the same time that we're going to celebrate 
the old immigrant past. And what it sets up is this discourse of the good old immigrant and the bad new immigrant. And I think that both of those things continue to be rooted in that 1790 logic of who belongs and who does not. That's one piece of it. And some of these, I mean, the deportations are obviously heart-wrenching. So you can have a picture like this. This is a woman whose, whose family is being deported, followed by this. Let's legalize the Irish. Let's celebrate the, the undocumented Irish, and let's help them find their way into citizenship. These things live very comfortably side by side in our political culture, and it's in part because of the continuing importance of that 1790 log logic. Barack Obama. There are many things we can say about him. There are many things we can say about his presidency. We can critique him from the right. We can critique him, critique him from the left. Not everything that's a critique is racist or even racialized. But I think we have to admit that race has something to do with the fact that there's a huge segment, or at least a sizable segment, of the American population who thinks that he's a usurper and that he's legitimate and there's no possible way he's the rightful president of this country. Right, you see it in the birtherism, where's the birth certificate? He's Kenyan, he's an immigrant, he's not right, he's not an American, he can't be my leader. There was a person in the street interview the very morning after the first electoral victory in 2008 and she was weeping, a middle-aged white woman weeping and saying, I feel like I've lost my country. I think you can't understand that without some reference to 1790. One of the other things that happens after Obama is elected is there's this upsurge of kind of a politics of white displacement. I'm mad as hell, I want my country back. Um, if, you can, if you can read, thank a teacher. If you can read English, thank a Marine. You know, it's a kind of bellicose white, if not supremacist, white primacist patriotism that surges forward when you have a black president. And one of the things that's amazing is the way in which immigration, too, becomes, again, once again, such a problem in, in the Obama years. If you just listened to the chatter of the culture, you would assume that immigration numbers are skyrocketing and that the government is doing nothing. That's what you would assume, because that's what's being said on every front. What's actually happening is that the numbers of immigrants has been steeply declining for a decade, both, both legal and undocumented, and the government under Obama has deported more immigrants than any other administration in American history. So where does all that anxiety come, come from? I think that it's, it's again, I, I want to argue, it's related to 1790. It's related to that notion of who the proper citizen is, therefore who the proper president is, and it spills over into these other discourses of immigration. And also of Islamophobia. And this is the last point I'll make, that there's a spike in hate crimes against American Muslims right around 9-11, uh, and it's, it's ugly, but it's short, and it's not a huge volume. And then it gets kind of quiet for a while. And then when Obama takes office, there's a sudden spike in anti-Muslim crimes around the country. And again, I think it's part of that same thing. You can see it, I went to an anti, I went to, as a documentarian, I did not participate, but as a documentarian, I went to, this is a piece of hate mail, by the way, mailed to an Islamic organization. Who's, it's a, a bacon American flag, and the, the, he's this is the civil rights director of, of an Islamic organization, and he said, it's like they think that pork is our kryptonite. <laughs> But in any case, Pam Geller, this is, um, Pam Geller is holding the book by Pam Geller, but she's become almost a, a celebrity for being an Islamophobe. Uh, and here she is at that rally in New York. It's a rally that drew about 5,000 people, I would say. And I mean, it was ugly and hate-filled and all about kind of the takeover of Islam in America. Um, everything I need to know about Islam I learned on 9-11. Salt in the wounds, Islam is intolerant, I will not submit. This is the Quran being used as toilet paper. In case you can't see it, she's wearing a t-shirt that says waterboarding instructor. Okay, this was a very difficult place to be. 
This fellow was a counter demonstrator, and it's, you, you can't really make it out the way this is projected, but he's wearing a t-shirt that includes the whole Obama family. And he's chanting, Obama, 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 and he's calling out the crowd, and he's saying, you're just pissed off because there's an African American in the White House, and you're taking it out on Islam and, and on uh, our Islamic neighbors, and you're, you're kind of hyping a threat because you feel displaced. That's what he's saying, and I think I kind of agree with him. You know, there's a lot to say about the relationship between race and religion when we talk about Islam and Islamophobia, and I'm happy to talk about that in more detail if you want to. Um, but one of the things is clear, right? When Jewish terrorists blew up a hotel in, in Jerusalem in the 1940s, people didn't look at the Torah to figure out their motives, right? When Irish terrorists set off bombs in London, Nobody looked at the New Testament to, to figure out their motives. But 18 guys hijack a couple of planes and knock down a couple of buildings, and people rush to, to cite chapter and verse of the Koran to say that every Muslim everywhere is culpable. And I think there's a sense in which that's kind of, it's like racial thinking, even if it's rooted in religion. And certainly, here's a, a uh, Lego terrorist. Certainly in the popular American imagination, Islam is racialized and certainly terrorism is also, is also race, racialized. And these are rooted in that soil of 1790. So taking refuge from that really ugly rally in New York, I went down a side street just to catch my breath. I was there for several hours shooting pictures and interviewing people. And I just had to get away for a minute and just catch my breath. And in this, in this side street, I met these other uh, two more counter demonstrators. Um, hate is not an American value. The thing I love about this photograph, and again, you can't see it so well because of the way it's projected, but there's a kind of melancholy on the face of the, the gentleman standing behind her. That, that just, it was resonant for, with what I was feeling. Because it was, it was really one of the, that rally was one of the hardest places I've ever been, just for the, the vitriol and the hatred that was pouring out. What I want to end with, though, is, okay, hate is not an American value. I just want to say, I think that there's evidence on both sides of that question. A lot of it. And that's both an optimistic and a pessimistic observation. But there's a lot of evidence on both sides of that question in American history. And I think that our, our duty as scholars and as citizens is to fight as hard as we can to make that placard true. And I will end right there. Thank you very much. Is this project? Ah, it is. Great. Do we have to just speak real loud? Forgive me, boys. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Is that okay? Um, my theology. And as sociologists, we sort of prize. Um, 
Well, yeah, it kind of has to be, right? But um, it's complicated. So I would, I mean, what's the, what do you have in mind exactly? or womanhood at bowl in terms of rightness that's a really interesting question I mean I think that where it gets complicated is I would say two things about it in the case of kind of American citizenship and what we're talking about tonight two things one is what are we not looking position in making the as an American making the case or making the claim? think about critique in, in ethical terms, other cultures, but also to always have a sight about where it is that you're standing. And not only, you know, what gives you the right, or, you know, what's, what's, what's the philosophical, ethical ground that you're standing on to make a case, but also the, the fallout of your being the one to make the case. Always, there's always kind of baggage in the room. Um, I don't know if that answers your question or not. I want to ask the same question, but I want to ask it a little. How do you get to there? How? Hold on. How do you get to there? Hate is not an American value, which is is I would say is symbolic of a consciousness of of reconciliation. Without responsibility, without accountability, without atonement. I totally agree. And that's, that's been um, in as much as. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, the civil rights movement to take a case accomplished a lot. There's no way that you can look at American society now and American society in the 1940s or 30s and say that that movement didn't accomplish a lot. There are meaningful things that happened. In as much as it was limited, I think one of the things that limited it is, is the refusal on the part of, of, of white America to take on that responsibility and to think it through. It, it, it became uh, a movement where blacks were going to assert, um, assert their equality and lay claim to it, um, but there was never that moment of reconciliation. And the, the culture and the momentum of the culture have made it very easy for white Americans to say it really had nothing to do with us to begin with, right? I'm not a bigot, so what do I have to do? Which is one of the reasons I try to teach these deep structural histories because you know this is not if you're a white person in this room this is not to say you're a bad person but it's to say that you're occupying a very particular space that has been created by a deep history and you're participating in it whether you want to or not and whether you know it or not and so you best know it right and that's the case for all of us in this room right so truth and reconciliation that model we would be in such better shape as a country right now if we had gone through something like that in the 1970s. What we went through instead was this white ethnic revival that allowed people to say, well, sorry, I'm fresh off the boat. 
you know, my, my grandfather came here in 1890, I had nothing to do with slavery, and to, which is an argument that accomplishes a bunch of things. It, it, it is a disavowal of white privilege, it's a disavowal of all of the things that go into that history of whiteness, um, but it is also a kind of re-narration of American history that, that makes Ellis Island in the post-emancipation moment the kind of, of the kind of touchstone of who we are as a nation, rather than Plymouth Rock, right? So there's a sense in which the last quarter of the 20th century and onward, um, Ellis Island becomes the touchstone of American history in a way that the story of the pilgrims in Plymouth Rock used to be. And so it, it cuts loose into deep antiquity things like the conquest of the continent and things like slavery, and it makes it very comfortably and conveniently easy for white people to say, well, I'm sympathetic to the black plight, but my family has, I, I, there's nothing about my own life that has anything to do with that. Um, and that, that kind of accountability um, you know, starts with education. It starts with learning what the history actually is, but it certainly doesn't end there. I mean, all of this, this kind of taking this, the next step is to really try to figure out what to do with it. I don't know if that answers your question either. Well, one of the things that is hopeful about this model, like there's, I can understand a kind of despairing response to this. It's like, oh my God, white supremacy is at the core of our political culture. It's been that way for centuries. What am I possibly gonna do about that, right? The other, the other piece of this though, is that there's this long history and long tradition of, of fighting for rights and making the ideals real. One of the quirks of American history is that as, as narrow and violent and bigoted and whatever you wanna say about that generation who not only enslaved um, Africans but then penned these laws that were so exclusive, whatever else you wanna say about them, they, they left us these documents in a universalist language that people could then could come up generations later and try to make real. And so there's a weird way in which, you know, Thomas Jefferson, the slaveholder, you know, left the documents that Martin Luther King would need to try to make the case about what real equality could look like. And so there is this kind of counter history embedded in our history that is, is usable and inspiring. And, um, you know, not to paint American history as this triumphal march towards an ideal society, but there are these moments of, of victory that are, are significant and are important and, um, you know, allow us to, to kind of think about our own social location, our own position in terms of what might a meaningful coalition look like and what might meaningful po political action look like. Um, I don't know if that, is that, Kind of where you're going, or? More or less, yeah. I guess as well as like outside forward projecting your opinions, so it's not just one way. Okay. Yeah. Well, the outside forces, I mean, one of the reasons, you can sit down, I mean, okay. whatever you want. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I mean one, of the, one of the reasons why I, I, and I blasted past it in a hurry, but Laverne and Shirley and Arthur Fonzarelli and The Godfather, one of the reasons it's that important, that that, that is important is, uh, as the theorist um, Stuart Hall said, it is culture that outfits us to be behave politically in certain ways and not in others. And so there are really deep 
political questions that can't be answered without recourse to things like popular culture, whether it's in our, in our era, you know, television, film, music, whatever, in the 19th century, you know, popular melodrama, those political cartoons I was talking about. But those, those are the things that, that carry, I mean, those are the things that kind of create what passes as common sense, right? That's the kind of common coin, and those things activate all kinds of political impulses and blunt others or even foreclose others. And so, um, to my mind, I mean, there are very few political questions, strictly political questions, that can't be answered without recourse to culture. Because it's, it's that language of culture that is, is, as Stuart Hall says, is outfitting us. This is where our response is going to come from, right? Well, here's something interesting. In, um, in Mein Kampf, Adolf Hitler talks about the 1924 immigration law in the United States as a model for how the state can use racial sciences. And so uh, the things that I was talking about, like this is a transatlantic discussion. So this is, I mean, let me be clear. I'm not saying that Calvin Coolidge is Adolf Hitler. I'm not making an equivalency. But I'm saying that, you know, Eugenics is a transatlantic, we would call it now a pseudoscience, but at the time, I mean, that was science. It was, and it was the biological sciences, and it was, I mean, there were a lot of disciplines involved in that worldview. And, and it took root in different ways, and it was deployed and used in different ways uh, in different places. In the United States, it was used to engineer an, a, an immigration policy that was kind of racially based and was meant to create a, a racially stabilized society. Um, in Germany, it was used in very different ways, but it was part of the same discussion, very much so. Oh, you and then I'll get back to you. Yeah. So I'm just curious um, with this large past stretching back throughout history of America, um, so deeply ingrained in the idea of whiteness. How do you suggest we move forward as a country to get away from? Well, I think um, step one is to really understand the history and to acknowledge it, to acknowledge that it's there, to acknowledge that it's in the room, to say, yes, in 1790, we said that you had to be white to be a citizen, and yes, that still matters in certain ways in 2014. If you could get a kind of consensus on that, you would be in a very different place than we are right now. It's only a first step, but it's a step. So part of it is knowing the history and acknowledging the history and, and learning how to ask different questions of it and how to, to challenge the conventional wisdom because the conventional wisdom is, is often just a way of, of couching things as they are, right? Or, or couching the arguments uh, or kind of concealing and buttressing um, the arguments for things as they are. So that's, that's one step and then as I said, another is using that knowledge as a way of rethinking then what is possible and where the fights are. Where are the fights? I mean, I think that there's a much broader fight. I don't know, so, I don't know if this is too charged an example to, to choose, but it's the one that's probably in people's minds right now, so I'll just use it. Ferguson. You know, there's a, a, a set of very specific and pretty narrow questions there that have to do with justice and policing and, and you know, the individual racism or not of, of the officer who did the shooting. But there are also much broader questions about policing and communities and, and what it means to be perceived as a threat everywhere you go. And so there are dialogues to be had about these things that are much broader than the dialogues that we tend to have. And one of the things I notice about Ferguson is that um, the African American community there seems to be wanting to have a completely different conversation than the white community wants to have there. And th those, that reality is rooted in history as well. But you know, if you can if you can find ways. So you know, one thing that I think would be important. We were talking about this a little bit earlier today. Um, I think that it would be terrifically important to see a lot of white people out in the streets of Ferguson um, protesting on behalf of their African American neighbors because. You know, if it is the case that this was a wrongful shooting, why should only the black people in town care about it? 
You know, so there are ways that, that white people can rethink and redeploy the meaning of their own privilege. You have the privilege to start a new conversation that might be harder for your African American or your immigrant neighbor to start. You know, so that's, that's one thing. And these, and these can be in small steps, but small steps are, are often uh, very meaningful ones as the history of the civil rights movement tells us. I mean, you know, four people decide to go back to this counter day after day and, and weather the abuse and try to desegregate this counter. And the next thing you know, there's like almost a revolution, right? Or at least a social one. You know, so even small acts are, are, should not be underestimated. You know, one of my favorite quotes, Margaret Mead said, never, this is a paraphrase, I can't get it right exactly, but she said, you know, never doubt that a small group of determined people can change the world. Nothing else ever has. Wow, right? So, I mean, I don't know what that leads you or anybody, or should lead you or anybody to do, but it's an important idea to take with you where you go. Oh, wait, there was somebody back here. Yeah. Wait, I'm sorry, they, they, I just missed that last part that you said. I totally, yeah, I think that that's, that's an important piece. I think it's, you know, dwelling on the horrendous past does become a really convenient way to just excuse the present, and, and we have to guard against that. Another piece of that, though, what you're saying about profiling, I mean, and this, you know, a lot of it just comes from imagination. It's like really being able to kind of, um, and this is another reason why understanding the deep structures and the deep history is important, because then you can depersonalize it. You know, it's not about me. Like, I didn't, I didn't do all of these things. This is just like, this is the house I live in, right? And, and you can examine it in a different way. And once you do, if you're able to step away, and it becomes easier to imagine things in a different way. And empathy becomes easier, but creative thinking becomes easier. So, for example, people who say, and I've, you've probably heard this argument a thousand times or some version of it, profiling isn't so bad because, besides, if they don't have anything to hide, why do they care, you know, that they're getting stopped by the police? Have, have you heard that argument? Well, the person who says that has obviously never lived a life where they've been under suspicion at every moment, right? So it's those leaps of imagination to, to just really think through, you know, not just to cr criticize somebody from where you're standing, you know, and say, well, if I were them, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be pissed off about racial profiling because, and then the, what the because is, is you're, you're not putting themself in, in, your, in, you're not putting yourself in their place, you're critiquing their place from your place, right? What's needed is to truly put yourself in that place and realize, oh, it doesn't just mean that I'm innocent and the, the guy is asking me to empty my pockets. It means that everywhere I go, I'm, I'm being treated as a second class citizen, I'm being under suspicion, I'm being stopped and frisked and all these things. Uh, and I'm living with a kind of a level of danger that adds up to second class citizenship. I mean, it's that kind of um, the imaginative leap that allows for a truer understanding. You were gonna say?
There was somebody over here. Oh. Two more, three more questions. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. That is a great question. Um, so here's a project for somebody in this room. In 19, well, this goes back further, but let's start in 1900. From 1900 to about 1915, it's very, very easy to find people like American presidents, people like Teddy Roosevelt, speaking in very unabashedly racist terms about the peoples of the world who are the objects of foreign policy. Like the Filipinos are unfit for self-government, we have to go over and take over their country because they obviously are making a mess of it. The people of Puerto Rico are inferior and we need, you know, you don't have to go further than the front page of the New York Times to find that kind of frank language. And the, the core principle involved is fitness for self-government and that's the phrase and it's deployed in the case, it's deployed in the case of the newly freed slaves, it's deployed in the case of Hawaiians in the 1890s, it's deployed in the case of the Filipinos after 1899, that's the phrase, fitness for self-government. What does that mean? It means exactly the same thing as 1790. That's what it means. So here's your assignment. Trace that language and find out where it disappears in the 20th century, because it does. Where's the moment where it drops out? That's part one. Part two is, then what do you make of foreign policy after that period? Does it change? Do we still tend to treat parts of the world, like Iraq, as though they're unfit for, for self-government? Or has there been a more genuine and fundamental change in the, in the US outlook in policy terms? But I think it's a, it's a crucial question. And it is um, one of the books um, that, that was mentioned earlier in my introduction, um, Barbarian Virtues, is about the relationship between immigration and foreign policy. Um, and it's mostly about that turn of the century period, but I think it, it tries to lay out some principles that would travel through the 20th century if you wanted to take that up in your own studies. Yeah. I think it's a really important fight. I mean, I think that, you know, one of the things after, this is an amazing moment in immigration politics because, um, because there's so many ugly things about it, starting with, with SB 1070 and certain other things. Um, but it's also in some ways an incredibly hopeful moment because of the kind of pro-immigrant mobilization starting in the aughts and kind of carrying forward. And I think that, that some of the coalitions that emerged, um, I mean, I'd be really interested to hear more about what's happening here on the ground in Whitewater, um, but certainly in, in, in larger immigrant um, communities in places like Los Angeles and New York, there's been a lot of, of really reinvigorated coalition building and a kind of recognition that there's a certain sense in which this, the struggle for immigrants' rights is the struggle for everyone's rights, and the struggle for Im immigrants' rights <coughs> is, in a sense, uh, this generation's civil rights movement, or at least a, an important wing of it. Um, and so, I mean, I, I admire the people who are, who are putting themselves on the line in that struggle, and I think it's a really important one. And, you know, something to say to, uh, to just add to that, and it goes back to some of the other things we were talking about. Um, it's not just the specific policies, but it's everything that ramifies from them, right? So in the case of stop and frisk, it's not just that it's merely inconvenient to get stopped and frisked every day, and it's not just that having that happen to you gives you a, a kind of second-class citizenship. It's also, if you be, reach a state where you're afraid of the police, you're probably going to live in a place that's more dangerous because, because there's no real policing. No one's going no to call the police, right? Um, because nobody trusts them. That's one of the ramifications, kind of un unseen to people from the outside, probably, or, or unthought about, but it's really important. Same things with immigrants' rights. I mean, if, <coughs> if immigrants have to live their lives undercover, it makes them vulnerable to a thousand other things that, that the immigrant 
the immigration debates don't even begin to discuss. In New Haven, there was an amazing movement several years ago with the support of our mayor at the time um, to supply city ID cards um, to immigrants, whether or not they were documented, because one of the things that was discovered was if they couldn't get IDs, they couldn't open bank accounts, and if they couldn't open bank accounts, they were sitting ducks for anyone who wanted to rob them on the street. And, and routinely, undocumented immigrants were getting mugged um, on Friday, right, their payday, if they were painters or yard workers or whatever they were doing. Um, and this, the, in, to their credit, the city government and the white citizens, largely white, also African-American citizens of New Haven, banded together and created a city ID card so that our undocumented neighbors could open bank accounts and wouldn't be vulnerable to that kind of. And I think that, you know, this issue, the dreamers, I mean, this is, it's, it's an issue that's fraught with all kinds of unseen consequences, unseen by the people who are on the outside of it. Like the, um, here in Um, how many more questions? I mean, I'm, I'm, I could stay here all night. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> Let's do keep the conversation yeah, going. Yeah, I, I've got your contact. Yeah. Great. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. You know I'm fascinated. What's that? Oh, right. Sometimes they can get myself some plants. Yeah. Miguel was, when he was a student, he was a student, he started to be a seat. And Bob was just Okay, oh, thank for you. the people who are staying, let's open this yeah. back up again. Thank you for speaking. Oh, it's very was arriving in a much more radical and fundamental and, and economically charged analysis of, of what was needed. 
Um, and, and part of that just has to do with with the, the what America looked like after 1965, right? I mean, the reason that there are riots in the West and in the North is that you can wipe these segregationist uh, laws off the books, which is a really important thing to do, but it didn't even touch what was happening in the North. So clearly that wasn't at the root of the problem, at least for people who were living in Oakland or Detroit, right? So you start to get, I mean, that's, that's really where black power comes from, that's where the urban rebellions come from, that's where the fragmentation of the movement begins. And then with the death of Kenya, it fragments even more. And then you get, you know, the Nixon White House just trying to step in and just decimate what's left with this kind of law and order policies and this law and order rhetoric. So there's, you know, the years between 1965 and 1973 are like a really important piece of the answer to your question. What happens after 1973 is much more subtle um, and much more complicated. You get enough African American advances to actually claim some success, and, and for whites to claim some success, right? This thing is over, look, I mean, there are black bankers now, what do you want, right? So that's one piece of it. Um, there's those kind of cultural threads that I was talking about. So, you know, among white ethnics, you get the, you know, I don't have anything to do with it, I'm just fresh off the boat narrative. In the South, I mean, look at something like Southern Rock, right? The, you know, Leonard Skinner, and, and the Allman Brothers, there's this way in which white youth in the South are desperate to find a way to be cool. They're desperate to find a way to be white and Southern, but not the villains of these civil rights narratives, right? Um, and it becomes, it, it occupies a similar space as the white ethnic revival. It becomes a kind of white disavowal with an involvement in, in the structures of white privacy. Um, so that's a layer of politics. And then you get, you know, a series of politicians who are, are kind of frank civil rights in terms of their policies or the ways that they've had different agencies and the like. The hopeful side of this, I mean, one, and in some ways the amazing side of this, is the election of Barack Obama in 2008. Like, whatever else you want to say about his presidency, you know, which is, is not, it's not been an easy ride, let's just put it that way. Whoever you are, the Obama, the Obama presidency has not been a smooth ride. But, there's, you know, nobody saw it coming. You know, in 2007, I don't think there was anybody in America who thought we were going to have a black president elected in the next election. Nobody saw that coming. And one of the things that I think is really important about that is that, you know, geologists talk about how under, under the river, the river bed is moving. And I think that that's one of the things that was happening in those post-civil rights years. I think that, that socially, all kinds of things that were happening that could result in the election of Barack Obama in 2008. It was like this silent revolution, kind of subterranean, kind of under the soil. And whatever else he did or did not accomplish, the fact that millions and millions and millions of Americans of every race stepped forward and pulled the lever, not only imagined a black president, but voted for one, is enormous. And what, you know, what could, could come out of that over time, I think, but they're, you know, my kids now, one is in college and one is a senior in high school, but they, they had a black president for their conscious lives. Like, that is normal to them. And that at least begins to break away at that logic of 1790 that's been in place for so long. One of my favorite photographs is a, it's a, a highway exit in Tampa, Florida, and it's a sign, it's one of those big green highway markers, and it says, you know, exit 
good, Martin Luther King Boulevard. And off in the distance, just below the sign, is a Confederate flag. Yeah. <laughs> and like that's kind of where we've been living, you know, since 1968. And we really do inhabit that country where both things are true. We're celebrating, we're celebrating Martin Luther King, and we're clinging to uh, the, the past of white Southern heritage and all that it means. And you know, the fight goes on. Right. Well, I think that um, it's important to just anticipate resistance and don't be surprised by it. And it's important to know yourself well enough to know what your contribution can be. You know, not not everyone not everyone is going to be a Rosa Parks, right? But there are all kinds of other things that can be done. And and I think that kind of knowing what you can commit to in that fight, knowing there's gonna be a fight. Like, what can you commit to? What are you gonna be best at? What is your contribution going to be? What is the way that you can make an intervention? And it's not a philosophical of question of like, what is the best intervention to be made? Although that's a question worth asking. But it's what's the intervention you're gonna make? And that you're gonna be able to make? You know, that you have, you know, the, the stamina to stick with? that you have the skills necessary, you know, all of those things. Um, I think that uh, we're too often cowed by the resistance that we meet because we have kidded ourselves that it's not gonna be there, you know, or we've lied to ourselves about what's gonna be possible. You know, there's a great, you know, just having just gone through this cycle of anniversaries around civil rights events, there was a, uh, um, anniversary event for SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, uh, and the work they had done, um, both both um, Southern African Americans and their white allies who went south during that period. And they had this uh, a reunion in, in Princeton a couple years ago. And one of the speakers, I wish I could remember his name, but he was recalling those days in Mississippi, um, going out day after day and trying to, you know, trying to summon the courage to go to these little shotgun shacks in nowhere, you know, in the Delta, and talk to people and convince them that they can find the power to get themselves out the door to go down to the courthouse and try to register to vote. Like, and, and the phrase that he used, he said, it took a kind of revolutionary patience. And I just thought that was brilliant, because we often, we think of revolution as being impatient. But the idea that what is required is revolutionary patience, I just thought was, was one of the most usable things of that whole history, right? That's what's required, is revolutionary patience. And part of that means just being able to stay with it, and part of it means you know, being as clear-sighted as you can about what you're going to face, and being as clear-sighted as you can about what it is that you're capable of. And, and then part of it is being creative, you know, kind of politically and tactically figuring out who to partner with and what and what are the, the political projects of intervention that, that seem meaningful at the moment. You know, and there's nothing wrong with starting small. I just want to pick it back up uh, my experience, you know, and I'm pretty sure other activists do the same thing, but uh, I consider myself an immigration activist since maybe 2008. And um, a lot of people, when they start doing, you know, activist work, they get motivated from a movie or something like that, and they go in and they don't see change happen right away, and that they don't know how to debate, maybe, or like, oh, I don't like to debate, I don't think I can withstand this, and I just slowly disappear. So, um, you know, it's great that you have the understanding. 
standing foothills that they have that commitment to go through the whole way. Um, especially, um, like you mentioned, you do have to have patience. Um, it's not going to be easy. Um, I actually worked as a telemarketer, so some of that resistance you know, <laughs> really helped out. There's no such um, thing as a wasted move. <laughs> you know, it's like... so, um, I think about this is um, one of the ways to think about how race operates, and this is embedded in everything I said, but I didn't articulate it. But one of the ways of looking at this is there's this tremendous clash in American political culture between a capitalist economy, and in some periods more than others, but especially in that industrializing era in the, in the late 19th century and through the early 20th century, a capitalist economy that is absolutely voracious and in need of unskilled labor from anywhere. We'll take them. I don't care where they're from. We need their labor. We need to exploit them. We need to use them. We need their labor. We need them to dig mines. We need them to build railroads. We need them to work in factories. We need them to melt down stone and make steel out of it. Right? We'll take anybody. And then on the other hand, so that's the economic part of it. And then on the other hand is the civic part of it. It's like this is a fragile experiment, this democracy, and we can't take everybody. We can, we can only certain, you know, only the, the people who are fit for self-government are going to fit in. There's a real contradiction at the very core of those two things. And race, I think, is one of the ways that that gets worked out. Race becomes the language by which people are accepted for their labor and rejected for their vote. And, and, and you can see that working in, with, in very different ways in different periods and with different groups. Um, but that's part of, of what's at work. Does, I don't know if that answers. one of the reasons why, you know, pick a period, it doesn't even matter, jump into the stream of American history. It could be the know-nothings in the 1850s, it could be the immigration restriction league in the 1890s, it could be the eugenicists in the run-up to the 1924 act, it could be um, the, uh, what's that group called, the board, that group, uh, the vigilantes who, who covered the border, um, Minutemen, it could be the Minutemen in, in 2014. At any moment that you jump in and look closely at the immigration debate, there's always an economic level to it, and there's always a civic level to it. So you'll, be, you'll hear the economic displacement argument, you know, they're displacing American workers, and we can't afford to bring them in. And you'll also hear the, you know, they're going to be bad citizens, and they're criminal, and they're not right, and you know, whatever. Those two things always coexist. What tends to drive the policy, and this is, it's tricky, what tends to drive the policy is the economics. In most cases, it's the economics and the, the perceived economic requirements that, that account for the change or the, the changes in policy most reliably. But at the same time, it always looks like it's the civic that's more important, just the, the rhetorical flights and the, the kind of the sound of the culture talking about immigration makes you think that the civic is going to be the more important thing. But behind the scenes, the economics tend to be more important. So, 
You know, if you just listened to the culture in the, 18, or in the 1990s, in the Clinton years, you would assume that, that policies were getting tighter and tighter, but in fact, they weren't. saying about intersectionality is really important. So in specific cases, like if you're really bearing down on the experience of holes in Milwaukee, it will be really important to look at the ways in which both the kind of internal and the external gender dynamics kind of shape that community and, and what that means for Polishness on that particular scene, and certainly the class dynamics of the community. Um, for this, I was really looking the national structures that establish, um, which tend to, to come in their most powerful ways in, in racial terms. And so I just, just charting that history was kind of, so it's, it's in a sense it's a meta history, right? It's the umbrella under which the specificities of Milwaukee Coles and Philadelphia Irish kind of live out their, live out their experience. But what you're saying is really important because um, those kinds of status differences um, and the ideological differences that go along with in terms of the, the, the diverse experiences within a group. There are two questions, or two levels to that question. So let me first talk about you and your students. And then we'll talk about you and your administrators and the parent body. You and your students. This, kind, this what you saw tonight, was kind of a version of my answer to that question. It's like, let's depersonalize it. You know, I certainly will not pretend that I understand your experience as an African American student. But I do know the history, and we can talk about it. And we happen to inhabit this country that's incredibly diverse. And it will be really important to know that my family came here by a route that is completely different than other people in the room. And we can talk about what those differences mean and how they manifest today in, in 2014. And it's not about us personally. It's about, it's about the way we inhabit 
a history that's really complicated. And we're not just going to celebrate, you know, soul food and, and knishes. We're going to talk about, you know, the structural differences between the African American experience and the Jewish immigrant experience, right? Um, I have found that in a diverse classroom, you can create a kind of comfort with that because people don't feel they're on the spot. They just feel like, you know, we're all just in this room trying to figure out this history. It doesn't have to be prickly. It doesn't have to be that difficult. There will be difficult questions entertained, but it doesn't have to be the kind of conversation that I think teachers often fear they will have if they try to talk about race. Um, so, you know, part of it is just understanding really clearly, like, where, where you stand and what your limitations are and expressing that to your students and inviting them to do the same thing. They're like, that's the starting point. You know, and staying true to the big historical picture um, as an object of study. Um, now, the second piece is much more difficult in a certain way um, because students will often accept things that their parents will not, you know, or that your principal will not. Um, I think that, well, I don't know if I even have an answer because I think that because the, the challenges are so different from one district to another or from one principal to another. I mean, I think there is a moral high ground that is often attainable on the part of educators. Just, you know, to say a version of what you just said, this is what happened. You know, why, why should we censor American history, right? The country is great enough to withstand looking at its warts, right? Even if its warts are horrendous. The, Or learning about, I mean, it, it, and it's not just that question of learning about your own history, but it's learning, learning this history, yeah, like right? things I've done over the years, there are a lot of summer programs, I'm sure they have them in Wisconsin too, where university faculty will teach workshops for high school teachers, and sometimes mid middle school teachers, and just, just to, um, and there's some school districts will give them accreditation and like all kinds of things for participating in these. Um, and they're really, they're really engaging and, and fun to teach, and people are really committed, and, and it's great. But at the end, every time I've done it, at the end, some number of people from the class will say, this has been great, it's been wonderful, it's been so eye-opening, I wish I could use it in the classroom, right? Because of the stupid, the regents tests and the standards and there are a million things that get in your way. Um, that is actually a civil rights issue. And that's not, a, that's not a teaching question, that's a political question that requires political action. And you know, one of the things I talked about, that fracturing moment in, in 1968 or thereabouts in the civil rights movement, you know, one of the things that came out of that and one shard of that fragmenting was people who were really committed to changing education and changing the curriculum and addressing it and, and you know, creating African American studies and women's studies and, and you know, revolutionizing what passes for knowledge. You know, and there are things that we kind of take for granted that one can study at a university in 2014 that were just absolutely revolutionary in 1968. And I think that the thing that you're describing, even though it's, it, the politics are different and it's more complicated because you're talking about you know, high schools or middle schools or, or even primary schools, but it's a similar kind of political struggle that needs to take place. Thank you very much. Thank you all.